line at the, at the end, uh, 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 and I'll say it now at the beginning, is that uh, adolescence is a period of great change, uh, and also in the post-adolescent period, things begin to get uh, more congealed with respect to certain developmental outcomes. Uh, and it's our uh, aspiration that if we intervene earlier on prior to the adolescent period, uh, that we may be able to uh, nudge directories, trajectories of development uh, along certain pathways that are more positive and optimal. So um, let me just uh, go right into this and, and, and describe uh, in a very stark way what the dilemma of adolescence actually is in today's culture. So puberty is occurring earlier and earlier, yet cognitive development and particularly the development of brain systems that are absolutely essential for regulation uh, are more strongly correlated with age and with experience. Uh, and so what this results in is a longer period than ever before in human history where the development of certain neural regulatory circuits, particularly in the prefrontal cortex, are lagging behind pubertal development. So the interval between the development of puberty and the maturation of certain brain systems that are critical for regulation is longer today than it's ever been before in human history. So what's the evidence for that? Well, um, let me show you a couple of slides uh, just to walk you through this. Um, uh, these are data for a 100-year period. They, they end in 1960. The curves um, uh, are even more frightening when you look in the modern period. But uh, I wanted to show you a 100-year period. And this shows data for different countries, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Italy, the UK, and the USA, beginning in 1860, going to 1960. And what's plotted is um, the age uh, of, at which menarche begins. Uh, and what you see is that there is a progressive decline uh, in, in age. And what we have today are individuals beginning the onset of puberty at age nine. Uh, uh, and so uh, that is happening in conjunction with the fact that, um, and I'll actually just show you this slide first, uh, uh, in conjunction with the fact that maturation of brain systems, and this is the white matter in the prefrontal cortex, which is absolutely critical for both the regulation of emotion and the regulation of attention, and the blue line is the curve for males, the red line is the curve for females, and it's showing the maturation of these white matter systems in the brain, and they are not fully mature until the mid-20s. Uh, and so we have puberty occurring earlier and earlier, and um, these neural systems that are implicated in regulation uh, on their own maturational path, which is much more strongly tied to age and experience. Now, what's the result of that? The result of that is actually pretty scary. If you look at data um, from the Center for Disease Control that have been um, released recently, and if you look at mortality um, during the, um, an early period uh, uh, and a later period in life that includes the uh, late adolescence period, what you see, this is mortality, um, what you see is a roughly 400 percent increase in mortality uh, in this group that brackets the late adolescent period compared to uh, this earlier childhood period, and these deaths are almost exclusively caused by behavioral factors, and they are preventable. They are deaths caused by substance abuse, by drunk driving, by violence, uh, and other, and suicide, other related characteristics. Um, uh, and uh, uh, these uh, uh, data, I think, are in at least some um, important ways connected with the evidence that I just showed you earlier concerning the um, lag between the development of the brain's regulatory systems and the onset of puberty. So um, 
One of the things that we do in our lab, uh, uh, and I'm not going to go into detail about this, but just to give you one picture uh, that should give you a feel for it, we can use new imaging methods to interrogate the pathways in the brain that are instrumental in providing regulation uh, and look at how those pathways develop through adolescence and also track the impact of certain interventions and curricula uh, that we think will induce experience-dependent changes in the brain and actually facilitate um, better emotion regulation and better regulation of attention. And this is um, uh, a single individual. This is data from a method called diffusion tensor imaging. And these, um, this exquisite uh, um, picture is uh, connections from the prefrontal cortex to an area in the subcortical region that is critical for generating emotion. And this image is what we call a mid-sagittal image if the brain was sliced in half through the nose and opened up. Uh, that's what you're seeing here. And so the left side of the picture is the front of the brain. The right side of the picture is the back of the brain. And um, this is showing the connections between the prefrontal cortex and an area that includes the amygdala, which is very important for certain kinds of negative emotion. And th there's a lot of reason to think and evidence to suggest that the... Um, the, the strength, the, the density of these connections is critically implicated in a child's capacity to regulate her or his emotions. And um, there also is evidence to suggest that certain kinds of training and experience can actually induce structural changes in the brain. So this leads us to the question whether we can teach our children to better regulate their negative emotions, cultivate more positive social skills, and better focus their attention and um, there, there is an answer to this question, and the answer is yes. Um, uh, and um, one uh, source of the affirmative answer comes from research on social and emotional learning, which is an, uh, a kind of near neighbor to the work that we're doing on the uh, uh, application of certain contemplative practices in education. Uh, and social and emotional learning is uh, attempting to uh, uh, specify certain social and emotional competencies for children and include self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. Um, and uh, these are all skills uh, which uh, recent research has found can actually be cultivated and enhanced through certain kinds of curricula. And, um, Social emotional learning is now legally mandated in a number of states throughout the United States. I think at last count there are 14 states where by state law it is required that social and emotional learning be incorporated at every age uh, from K through 12. Uh, Wisconsin, unfortunately, is not among those states. Uh, hopefully you can all help to agitate to make it so. However, um, uh, it is the case that social and emotional learning has been adopted by the Madison Metropolitan School District. Uh, uh, and it's been adopted system-wide uh, in preschool through 12th grades. And uh, you can go on the MMSD website and take a look in the standards uh, as they are described by the Madison Metropolitan School District are these. One is to understand and manage one's emotions as well as express empathy. The second is to develop positive self-identity and recognize the self as a lifelong learner. And the third is to establish and maintain positive social relationships by respecting others, practicing social skills, and making responsible choices while recognizing civic responsibility. This comes directly from um, the Madison Metropolitan School District. So uh, th these are the... Um, the standards that have been adopted. Now the big question is how are we going to actually teach so that these standards are met? Um, uh, and uh, there, there are data to suggest that curricula based on these principles of social and emotional learning have um, some very positive consequences. There is a meta-analysis which has just recently been published. And for those of you who don't know what a meta-analysis is, it's an analysis of 
many different studies that are amalgamated to uh, help reach more definitive kinds of conclusions. And this meta-analysis included 207 studies that involved more than 280,000 school children from across the United States. And the study found an improvement in social and emotional skills, more positive attitudes uh, of the children toward themselves, toward others, and toward school, improvement in social and, and classroom behavior, decreases in classroom misbehavior and aggression, including bullying, uh, decreases in emotional distress, such as stress and depression, and finally, an improvement in standardized test scores in school grades. And in fact, on standardized tests, there was an average increase of 11 percentage points that was found in this large national study that involved over 280,000 children. So although in these cases the curricula were exclusively focused on social and emotional skills, there was unequivocal benefit uh, in improving certain cognitive skills. So what are the contributions from the contemplative traditions and how might there be some value added and this is an issue that we've pondered in some of our work. And let me just name a few. One is the importance of practice. Uh, one of the things that we've learned from both the contemplative traditions as well as from modern neuroscience is that if we want to cultivate more positive habits of mind, practice is required. Uh, and continuous practice is required. Uh, and so... Um, uh, none of you would ever think that if you engaged in a program of eight weeks of physical exercise once a week uh, or twice a week that you would then enjoy the benefits that might accrue from that exercise program if you then stopped exercising after the eight weeks. Of course that wouldn't happen. And it's the same with these other kinds of skills. These skills, in order to really... Um, inculcate them as habits of mind require practice. And that's something that we've learned, again, both from the principles of neuroscience as well as from the contemplative traditions. In some of the contemplative traditions, there are uh, what's been called the four immeasurables, and um, they uh, are four qualities of the mind, uh, which we think are best regarded as the product of skills that can be enhanced through training. And they are... Uh, loving kindness, or the wish that others be happy. Uh, compassion, which is the wish uh, to relieve others of suffering. The third is sympathetic joy, which is wonderful to practice in the middle of a competitive academic environment, which is um, the experience of joy in response to others' success and joy. So, you know, when your colleague gets a really... Um, important paper published in a very prestigious journal, you know, the typical response is, oh, that's very good. Um, uh, uh, and um, to intentionally practice sympathetic joy is really something quite important. And finally, the fourth quality is equanimity, uh, a kind of calm, balanced uh, approach. And uh, I think um, you'll see examples of that in some of the work that, that we've done in uh, the preschool setting as well as in elementary school as we go along today. So the idea that these are all qualities that are the product of skills that can be cultivated and enhanced through training is really central to this message. And finally, um, uh, one of the benefits of these approaches is that there is a provision of very specific, highly detailed exercises that can be used to strengthen these qualities that we can um, I think uh, introduced in a completely secular way uh, with, um, you know, the, the, the public embracing this. Um, uh, and so that's really what we've done. Uh, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time and just end by saying that to, to catalyze and focus our efforts, we've launched the Center for Investigating Healthy Minds. And the vision of our center is to create a world through research and outreach in which healthy qualities of mind are investigated and valued. And our major activities include basic research, translational research, which you'll hear about today, uh, outreach, which you're all participating in right now, and training the next generation of scholars who will continue this work as we go forward. Uh, and these are some of the translational research activities in which we're engaged, and you'll hear about 
a number of them today. Uh, and I encourage you to learn more by checking out our website, investigatinghealthyminds.org. And so um, uh, I think I'm ending exactly on time, uh, which is rare for me, but let me end also with um, really what I consider the most important slide, and there's not a day that goes by without me um, very uh, uh, intentionally pausing uh, and uh, just reflecting on the amazing opportunity that we have uh, and the gratitude that I have for the people who are really doing the work. I just sometimes get up, have the opportunity to get up and talk about it, but these are the people who are really doing the work, and you're going to be hearing from a number of them today, and um, we will introduce them uh, as we go along. So uh, thank you all very much for coming this morning, and uh, there will now be a few minutes for questions, so thank you. Uh, questions? Yes, please. So, how does the line of work is focused very specifically in you know, parts of the nervous system, et cetera? But clearly, the, uh, the activity or the influence of the environment has a huge impact on the effectiveness of these efforts. So, as a parent, you know, what do you think are some observable, measurable key elements of the school environment that will facilitate, you know, success of efforts like these? Well, I think that from my perspective, and we'll hear from the, the real experts who are in the school soon, I'm just um, really uh, a rank amateur uh, in, in lots of ways at this. Um, but my own view is that the most important thing we can do for the environment of the schools is to have to do what we can to facilitate the staff and the teachers embodying these qualities because that's how they can impart them to the children. And um, one of the commitments that we've made um, uh, in a way that is absolutely unwavering is that uh, when we introduce these curricula in the schools for the kids, we first introduce it to the teachers and have the teachers go through um, very intensive training themselves before we introduce these um, practices and um, uh, curricula for the children. Uh, because it's very important that the teachers be able to model uh, this kind of behavior themselves uh, if they are, um, if, if we have any hope of, I think, um, having our children uh, learn and embody these skills. So the, the most, you know, in general, I think the most powerful um, uh, kind of teaching is through uh, social learning, where the adults in a child's environment embody the kinds of qualities that we hope to impart. Sorry, I'll move back there in a second. I just wanted to ask, um, how close is Wisconsin to getting this SEL mandate, or uh, what can we do? I, I'm not sure. There, there are people in the audience who are, know a lot more about this than I do. So you can ask that um, uh, uh, when we have the panel of experts, um, uh, some of whom are uh, within the Madison Metropolitan School District, and we have a um, uh, principal here who will, um, I'm sure, be able to comment on that. Yes, back there, please. Are you studying how the use of technology among adolescents, you know, this enormous reliance on all of these, you know, their computers and Facebook, and is also contributing to this dynamic, and how you can factor that into mindfulness training? And yeah, it's a great question, um, and. Uh, uh, we, we, it, we're not so much studying the impact, but we decided, you know, there's no, no possibility of beating them, so let's join them. Um, let's see if we can actually use this technology in ways that can help promote these kinds of qualities. So we're actually now involved with um, developing a, uh, a video game uh, to help uh, train attention. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and, and more broadly, mindfulness. And this is something that um, one of the graduate students in our center has been working on for quite some time, 
Uh, and um, we're hopeful that uh, this will have some promise in the future. So uh, uh, there's a lot of research that still is required to uh, empirically validate these kinds of methods. But I think that there are ways to harness uh, the use of game-like technology for um, constructive purposes along these lines. And there are a number of other people who uh, have, have gotten involved. And we've been interacting extensively with a group here in the School of Education uh, that um, is involved with developing games for educational purposes, and they're quite excited about these possibilities. Yes, please. Uh, Teresa Wright, uh, you patiently had your hand up for a long time. Do you, <laughs> do you think that some of this can be translated into the high school and college level, uh, possibly by working with, say, I've been at this level of education and frustrated intensely with the way we do it, and whether we can make the changes not only with the uh, adults, we're past that changing state, that growing stage, with the adults who are involved at the upper level education, and uh, that also be able within that context have any success with the young people who have already reached that stage. Um, uh, has anybody thought about this? Yes. And, yeah. Yes. And so, you know, let me say that uh, although we know that plasticity is greater uh, in earlier periods of development than in later periods of development, plasticity is present throughout life. Uh, so there's hope for all of us. Uh, and. Um, uh, and also, uh, we, we have indeed done studies. Uh, we, we've recently completed a study, for example, uh, in uh, freshmen and sophomores in college, uh, basically um, kids in their, between 18 and 20, uh, where we taught them a simple um, uh, intervention uh, that is designed to teach or to enhance compassion. And uh, we, this was in the context of a very rigorous controlled experimental design where they were randomly assigned to a compassion group or to a, another kind of training group. And we did brain scans before and after their training, uh, after two weeks of training. And um, what we found is that the brain changed in systematic ways and also they showed more uh, altruistic and cooperative behavior after just two weeks of training, 30 minutes a day. So uh, I think that there is a lot of opportunity. You know, it's amazing. We just, you know, we don't think about kindness uh, as a skill or happiness as a skill. And if there's one thing that I hope all of you will come away with today, it's that these are all products of um, uh, uh, of factors that can be enhanced through training. Uh, they're, they're, they really should be thought of as skills. And if we just practice them even a little bit, you'll be amazed at how much they can actually shift. Uh, you just referenced brain scans. And after the two weeks and that, which type of brain scans did you do, use? Uh, functional MRI. Is this training available for members of the community if we wanted to come in? Do you have any opportunities for us? Yeah, yeah um, you know, we get asked that question a lot. We're, we're uh, a research organization, uh, and, you know, we don't offer um, uh, training for the community in general, although we have uh, uh, various opportunities uh, uh, in the course of uh, workshops and, and lectures for people to, to learn a little bit. In fact, later today you'll all be introduced to some of these practices directly. Um, uh, I also, th there are a lot of resources available in Madison, in the Madison area, uh, and if you go on to our website, you can find resources. Uh, the Division of Integrative Medicine here at the University of Wisconsin Medical School and School of Public Health offers mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is a secular form of mindfulness and, and 
kindness training uh, that uh, is taught by a wonderful group of people that we're very lucky to have here in the community. Uh, and that's one place that I would certainly encourage all of you to explore if you had interests in this area. Please excuse my ADD if you've covered this. You use a lot of words that, to me, sound Zen Buddhist. Sounds? Zen Buddhist. Uh, well, um, uh, I, you know, it's uh, uh, some of the um, concepts and practices are derived from the Buddhist tradition. Uh, some are uh, derived from our understanding of brain research. Um, but what we do uh, when we uh, introduce these programs into the school settings um, is really uh, absolutely entirely secular, and uh, uh, they are really methods to train attention and to train uh, in the regulation of emotion. They're nothing more and nothing less. Uh, and, um, you know, we'll take uh, uh, useful suggestions from anywhere, uh, and test them scientifically, and if they work, it's great. So it doesn't really matter where they come from. So, so here I am. What did you say? What can you do for me? And I'm here to help. <laughs> Thank you. This is not really a question, but a statement of gratitude. I knew Harry. I used to skate with Harry at the Madison Figure Skating Club, and he was a very kind and compassionate man, also very smart, intelligent, and full of fun. And one thing I remember about him is that he was a real Pied Piper. The children at the skating club used to follow him around just to talk with him and be with him. He would be thrilled with what you are doing today. Thank, Thank you, you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, one or two more questions. Please, in the back. to cause people to, um, you know, have more compassion, kindness, whatever. How long did those effects last? Did you follow up afterward to, you know, just how plastic is a person's brain? Uh, so, you know, th this is a question we've gotten frequently, and um, the answer is they won't last unless people continue to practice. Is, is the, the, the evidence that we have clearly suggests that, um, particularly with people who are just beginning to practice. And this, again, goes back to my comment about physical exercise. You wouldn't think that two weeks of physical exercise that you do will then produce benefits that will last for the rest of your life if you stop exercising after the two weeks. So the same thing with these other qualities. You've got to practice them on a regular basis. Uh, and, you know, it's not so hard to practice them. And the goal of introducing this very early on in the curriculum is that uh, when you practice it enough, it becomes spontaneous and automatic. Uh, and so every time you see a person, you'll just be, um, you'll have a kind of automatic stance of wanting to be helpful, expressing gratitude, kind of basic civility and kindness, but they'll be, they'll, it'll arise automatically. Uh, and that's what will happen with longer term practice based on the little bit of evidence that we have. But there's still you know, a lot more science that's required and uh, we do not know what the optimal uh, kind of dosing of these uh, training practices are. Uh, we don't know uh, what the minimum practice is that's required to sustain these benefits. Uh, those are all questions which require uh, additional, uh, much more systematic scientific work. Mark, well, you can be the last question. What is the impact of, in, uh, the impact of parental or teacher interactions that, that are not leading exercises with kids, but actually 
helping, showing, helping guiding kids with delighting in attention, helping guiding kids as they're regulating their emotions. Can you study that? Uh, I think it can be studied, and my own conjecture is that they're enormously important. Uh, and th this really goes back to um, the response that I gave to an earlier question about, uh, about the environment and what, what the most important features of the environment are. And I think that um, probably the most important features are the embodiment of these qualities in parents and teachers themselves uh, and just through how they do things, who they are, their presence, uh, will uh, communicate and teach children in a very important way. Uh, and so I think that there's a tremendous amount of informal learning that uh, occurs in the classroom and that also occurs in, a, in the relationship between a child and her or his parents. Um, and uh, this kind of social modeling, if you will, is, is very, very powerful. Uh, and th th there's extensive research um, uh, at a neuroscientific level showing, uh, mostly done in animal species, um, non-human species, showing that the kind of behavior that a parent expresses toward its offspring has enormously important role in shaping the brain of the offspring and shaping it down to the level of gene expression. That is, the way a parent behaves toward its offspring will actually induce certain um, changes in gene expression in those offspring, and uh, those changes are extremely consequential for the behavior of the offspring. So uh, I think a lot does get transacted in those kind of informal ways, which is why we think it's so important when we offer this kind of curriculum to children, we also offer it to teachers and ideally also to parents.